Hello there, everyone, and welcome, welcome to the Slam Jam Wrestling Podcast from Extreme.tv. So, first of all, my name is David Postansky, and I would like to welcome you to the show. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to smash that subscribe button wherever you are listening to the show. If it is on a podcast platform such as iTunes or Spreaker or Google Podcast or wherever, or if you're watching the video version and you're on youtube.com forward slash extreme improv. But for now, let's get on with the show. And this is the review of WrestleMania 37. So, let's go through what actually happened, or what almost didn't, in fact, happen on the show. Because as I'm sure everyone has seen the show, if you haven't seen the show, I will fill in the gaps where I can. The show almost was a non-starter, just because after one year, one week, one day, or one year, one month, one day, whatever they said, we haven't had fans live in attendance for WWE. And in Tampa Bay, where WrestleMania 37 was taking place, there was severe weather warnings. And so fans were ejected from their seats. They had to wait in their cars just because there might be lightning. There was like heavy rain and the rain did play a part in the actual show itself. And we almost didn't get the show happening. And imagine if it just not happened the first night. Of course, they could have suddenly said, well, the second night is going to happen and all the matches are going to be on night two. But with the amount of fans who've got tickets, and it would have been an absolute nightmare. So they got the clearance within an hour before the show beginning. And it was like people on Twitter being very humorous, just saying about, oh, this is revenge by God for... Vince McMahon fighting him some 15 odd years ago, whatever it was, tagging with Shawn Michaels and God against, I think, Shane and Vince McMahon. But then they actually started the show. Vince McMahon came out on stage with everyone. I acknowledged that they haven't had fans over the last year during the pandemic. (coughs) And that they were now back. Welcome to WrestleMania. As soon as the show then began... They suddenly said, oh, we're going to go backstage to some interviews just because we've got another severe weather warning. Now, this was the last time they had one of these weather warnings. And after about another 10 or 15 minutes, they did get on with the show proper. And these these segments in the back, they were they were really good. Actually, they were a lot of fun just that they had people like I think the first one to come out was Shane McMahon and Shane McMahon was saying whatever about, oh, I'm ready for Braun Strowman, and then he was interrupted by Bobby Lashley and MVP, and that was quite good, but except for these were clearly off the cuff, because the first thing that MVP said is like, the time is for talking is over, and it's like, well, why are we talking? And then they were interrupted by Drew McIntyre, which was good, because it had face-to-face between the opponents backstage some in some respects this may take something away from their being face to face in the ring but as long as they were showing this to the audience it would have been a bit of hype for they're going to start brawling backstage which they didn't and i wonder if they were given like the instructions don't start a fight back here and they might have done one or two more of these backstage but then they eventually did actually start the show titus o'neill and hulk hogan came out to a mostly positive uh, response for Hogan. Obviously, Hogan's had a lot of controversy around him over the last few years, but they've paired him up with Titus, and Titus obviously just won the Warrior Awards, you know, to go into the Hall of Fame. Although later in the show, when they brought out, and it was I think on night two, in fact, or was it night one? Yeah, I think it was night one where they brought out Titus. Say was 2020 Warrior Award winner. It's, uh, it always feels a shame that they say that they're the Warrior Award winner instead of saying that they're actually just in the Hall of Fame. So could he still, in theory, be inducted into the Hall of Fame in however many years? Because it feels like he won't be now. And obviously being the Warrior Award winner is very good. But I don't know if they actually give him a Hall of Fame ring. But anyway, so Hogan and Titus did their introduction. And when they came to do their introductions on night two and they're dressed as pirates, that was very cool. I suppose for the first night it was good that he came uh, Titus out in a suit, Hogan dressed as Hogan normally does. And then it was a bit more fitting of the theme for night two. Maybe that was always the plan. Who knows? But 
we opened up with Drew McIntyre going against the almighty WWE champion Bobby Lashley for the championship. Now, loads and loads of people thought that this was just an opportunity for Drew McIntyre to be crowned as the WWE champion in front of a live audience because he didn't get that opportunity last year. And then Lashley won. And do you know what? I'm really, really pleased that Lashley won. This was a hell of a good match. This was one of the... When they've done, like, world championship matches opening a WrestleMania, this ranks up there with some of my favourite. It was an incredibly solid match. And it was very hard-hitting. You could see how excited they were to be out in front of a live crowd. They haven't been in front of a live crowd in an entire year. And they really went for it. Like... Going over the top rope, uh, Drew McIntyre just crashed down. Obviously, MVP and Lashley were out there to absorb some of the blow, but he went with a hell of a crash. Um, the ending was a little bit dodgy, just with the going for the Claymore from um, Drew McIntyre. MVP on the outside causes the distraction by shouting to Lashley, which distracts McIntyre enough to miss the Claymore and then Bobby Lashley puts him into the Hurt Lock McIntyre teases that he's going to roll out of it, I thought he was going to roll out of it into a cover and win but Lashley was just able to keep it locked in and eventually McIntyre uh, passed out, referee stopped the fight technical submission, technical knockout and with that Lashley retains, now it would have been great for McIntyre to get his win in front of the crowd and everything like they, you know, like everyone thought was going to happen. But clearly they didn't quite come to this plan that long ago. And clearly they realised that it would be a mistake to take the belt off of Lashley at this stage. Because Lashley, 16 years in the making, or 17 years in the making, to become WWE champion from when he was there back in the time when he was the ECW champion and in one of the main event matches at WrestleMania where he was in the corner of Donald J. Trump against Vince McMahon um, with Umaga in his corner, or vice versa, um, that being McMahon in the corner of Umaga. But anyway, that's a long time in between. He was then obviously a multi-time world champion elsewhere in TNA and well, Impact Wrestling, I should say. And for him to then be world champion here in the WWE, he is clearly someone that always should have been a world champion. There are some people that have got the wrestling ability, who have got the look, who have got the athleticism, that they should just... The size... It's like, yes, that person should be a world champion. I would completely believe it. He's he's a exciting wrestler to watch. He's obviously a lot more experienced than he was in his first run. But even back then, it would have been like... Yeah, he's quite new, but this is a guy that could be world champion and should be world champion. Now, the same was true with Drew McIntyre, and I was never a big fan of McIntyre during his very first run, just because I felt like there were other wrestlers who I'd like to have seen receive the push like it looked like he was going to get, but then everything went wrong for him, so the story to get him to WrestleMania last year did feel earned. And obviously then there was no audience. So doing this in front of the audience this year, it would have been great for McIntyre to win. But Lashley's only had the belt for a few weeks. He obviously beat The Miz, who he helped beat McIntyre for it. And it's just the timing wasn't right to take it off of Lashley. Lashley, they're onto something good here. They shouldn't have broke up the Hurt business. Hopefully they'll reunite them and you know have that squadron that that image where they'd got the tag belts the world title mvp sat in the front uh with his cane looking like there's some miniature empire growing that would have been great they could have continued that but anyway it was a great opening match uh it went just under 20 minutes I think everyone was surprised that Lashley won, but it was a good surprise. It meant, okay, so here we are. Here we are. They're not going to necessarily give us the happily ever after at this WrestleMania. There was thoughts that, oh, they're just going to make all of the baby faces win, and so everyone comes away feeling super happy. But this was a good match. I don't think most fans were upset the, that Lashley retained. And with that, uh, we had the tag team turmoil match, which um, was won by... Natty Neidhart and Tamina which is great to see because I have felt over the years that Natty Neidhart 
and Tamina, especially Tamina, are both ones that yes, they've got them in the in the in the WWE because of their connections to their to their wrestling relatives. Obviously, Jimmy Ann from Neidhart and the Hart Foundation and Superfly Jimmy Snooker. But it always felt like, yeah, we'll use them at times and Natty they'll use here and there, but it was always like, well, we'll come back to Natty because she's reliable, she's very good in the ring, but they'll always have someone else that they'll push in front of her. And Tamina, it just never felt like they fully pushed Tamina. So this felt like a a real showcase that, yes, okay, we're finally using Tamina. Uh, it, it was a good match. Obviously, we had the the slipping on the rain, as I mentioned, would become relevant. Uh, just as Dana Brooks and Mandy Rose came down the aisle, then, you know, that was... And then it was brilliant with Mandy Rose backstage afterwards doing, like, a TikTok or Instagram video. And Titus comes up saying, hey, it happens to the best of us about slipping whilst coming down the aisle. Because, obviously, Titus famously slid all the way under the ring at the Greatest Royal Rumble. Nothing will beat that, but this... Uh, it was an amusing moment, but we did see little moments of wrestlers being careful. Randy Orton the next night was super cautious whilst walking down the aisle. And I think Tony Khan put out a tweet saying, hey, put down carpets. And I'm not sure if they did for night two. I, I, you know I think they might actually have done that. Just let's see if I can see the entrance aisle. I just need to put this on mute. I'm going to check this literally right now. Just as we see... Coming down the aisle, let's see, do we see them? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. No, I don't think they did, but they should have done. Just put down, like, carpets just so people didn't slip, because I think AJ Styles went to go up onto the top rope at a certain point and almost had a slip, and they said about, well, yeah, it's it's been raining, and so wet boots or whatever, even if they have the ring undercover, if the wrestlers have walked down the entrance ramp and it's damp, then they could have had an accident. But anyway... You're not here to hear about the weather. We're here to talk about WrestleMania. So, continuing on, who else was in the tag team turmoil match? Obviously, the winners would face uh, Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax the next night. But we had Lana and Naomi. And, you know, Lana is so much better than she used to be. Naomi's always been very good. Uh, Billy Kay, Carmella... Uh, also there we had the riot squad who obviously went towards the end but obviously we had uh, natty and tamina win and it, and it was a good match it was a good opportunity to have a lot of the women's roster to still be involved in the show obviously there is still the balance of the men's division having most of the screen time but this was a good way to get them involved without it just being a women's wrestlemania battle royal or like they did the andre battle royal on smackdown not sure if they did the women's one on raw but either way cesaro then had a really really good match with seth rollins and the hype around this was that it was cesaro's first ever ever singles match after 10 years in the wwe it seems incredible if someone had said to me how long cesaro been in the wwe i would have said six years I would have thought, is it six years? It's definitely more than four years. If someone said it was five years, I'd believe it. But apparently it is six... uh, Sorry, not six years. It's ten years. And he's never had a singles match at WrestleMania. And it goes to show, when you think about all the talk where they say about the brass ring, which Vince McMahon said about reaching for the brass ring, that came from Stone, Stone Cold Steve Austin saying about, hey, why isn't Cesaro being pushed as a main eventer? He's great. And McMahon's like, well, some people need to really, you know, stretch themselves and push for it like they did in the Attitude Era to reach for the brass ring. Well, finally, Cesaro's being used here, but let's just have a look. Now, obviously, we've got a lot of slightly older wrestlers. Edge in a main event, Lashley's in his mid-40s. Let's see, how old is Cesaro? He's literally 40, so... He, his, he's reached his peak of his in-ring psychology, perhaps usually by about the age 40. He's probably with, still within absolutely his prime, but probably just at the later end of it. So have we missed the boat to have Cesaro really going as a main eventer? Who knows? Either way, really good match. Seth Rollins, obviously, these guys go back to the Ring of Honor days and... 
that you know we had the we had the swing at the end where we had him swung around like they said 22 23 times i'm not quite sure how the audience count it because it sounds like when they count these things they go one two three and it's like they they count the next one as soon as they finish the last number not because we have actually done one complete swing but it, it was still very cool to see we had AJ Styles and Omos against The New Day, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods. Biggie Langston came out just to do their intro, which was very cool. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this was interesting, just because AJ did the majority of the match with Kofi and Xavier, with the whole thing being about, oh, we're going to tag in Omos soon. And when AJ went to tag him, he was reaching out and it wasn't looking like he was really trying to reach. Because if he was really trying to reach, he would have reached. He's just that huge. But Omos did eventually get in and then it was just all over. He just absolutely um, squashed Kofi and Xavier and then got the win. I think pinning Kofi. I think pinning Kofi. I might be remembering wrong. Just I think AJ was like, oh, put one foot on his chest or whatever and he just stood there. Looked really dominant. Uh, AJ then was sat on his shoulders with the tag belts. That puts AJ Styles into the Grand Slam Winners Club because he's now been a tag team champion, world champion, US champion, intercontinental champion. So I believe AJ Styles now been Grand Slam champion. I'll just fact check this just as we're talking here. So yeah, like just going through on the Wikipedia article, see his what he's won. Let's see WWE. And he's won WWE Championship twice, one time Intercontinental, three time US Champion. So yeah, only one time Intercontinental Champion. Raw Tag Team Championship and current champion. And let's see. Yeah, so AJ's had a heck of a career in every promotion he's in. It was a shame that AJ Styles, it came out within the last week that he would have wanted to wrestle Triple H and that would have obviously seemed like a bigger match for AJ, especially after last year being in the main event of Night 1, which some debate, well, was that just the midway point of WrestleMania or was that actually the WrestleMania main event? And just going by, especially this year, it's solidified that Night 1 of WrestleMania's main event is a WrestleMania main event. So with this... It was a little bit of shame that AJ was suddenly just match number four in a tag title match. Good that he won tag title, but always rooting for Ray J. Ray J. For AJ, it was at the Raymond James Stadium, so that's the uh, <laughs> the Ray J that I'm talking about right now. But at the Ray J. Stadium, it was great for AJ Styles to win the belt, have that WrestleMania moment along with Omos in his first match. And this guy's an absolute beast. Who knows what he'll be able to do going forward. Clearly, even just like the psychology of him leaning forward for the tag, it was just like you didn't look like you were trying because you could have reached. And I know it's like a really minor thing, but he was very slow going across the ring. And I think they were doing little with him, but to good effect, which is no bad thing, but I think he's probably still quite green. Then we had Steel Cage match, Braun Strowman versus Shane McMahon and Braun is himself someone who is an example of someone who is huge and was green but obviously now is a lot more accomplished and last year he was unexpectedly in a world title match or universal title match winning the belt from Goldberg and this is still a marquee match if you're going against Shane McMahon steel cage match but uh, is another step down just in terms of from where he was last year. He didn't stay in the Universal title picture, obviously. Uh, it was a good match. Shane took a crazy bump, you know, fairly standard stuff. Uh, not the longest match on the card. One of the shorter ones, in fact, just taking a look here. Yeah, sec second shortest match on the card. But you don't, you don't, there's only so much that Braun and Shane could realistically do just because of the size difference, the steel cage. It, it was great at the end. If a little bit signposted, Shane was clearly escaping. Braun should have got to him quicker, grabbed through the cage, then literally ripped the cage um, to pull Shane back through and then chucked him off the top. So that was good. We had Bad Bunny and Damian Priest against The Miz and John Morrison. Now, this was really good. 
in many ways and it does have a couple of points where it wasn't so good Miz and Morrison almost seem a little bit the comedic Dick Dastardly and Muttley kind of duo in many ways just because with the Miz being world champion a month ago and then losing it to being in this it's just like they had him with the money in the bank they had to do something to resolve that they gave him the belt they took away the belt And then he was feuding with Bad Bunny, and Bad Bunny dominated him at times. He dominated Bad Bunny at times, but... You know, John Morrison giving The Miz advice, don't let him make you angry, don't get angry, get smart. Um, It's just like, Bad Bunny, he, on the poster, he looks really good in his, like, SWAT gear, riot gear, whatever he was wearing, and it's like, wow, okay, he looks like he could actually get in the ring. But actually, in the ring, he looked small. The Miz is deceptively big. Let's see if I can find out. The Miz, the Miz. So the Miz, his build height is... uh, Let's see. I don't know. I can't find where his build height is. Six foot two. Six foot two. So I don't know what Bad Bunny is. Um, And I don't know if I'll be able to actually get that information quickly it's not important but he did look small so for whatever he's been working out he obviously not got the benefit of time since the royal rumble where he came out just to sing the booker t song with booker t booker t was on commentary for this morrison did a spinner at a certain point and i was expecting booker t to get involved some way or another but he didn't so whether or not morrison had cleared with him that he was going to do a spinner or not who knows be interesting to hear if there was any heat later i'm sure in a sense booker t may have just been pleased just because it's like well it gets people talking about me but at the same time he might feel if that wasn't cleared with him that well if he's going to do my move on wrestlemania and i'm not going to get any comeback on this then he might have reason not to be happy damien priest didn't tag in for ages and so we were waiting for the hot tag from damien priest once he got in you know, Damien Priest is very good, and it was a bit more back and forth, and then Bad Bunny was getting in occasionally. I would have liked it if Damien Priest had been in a little bit more at the beginning. Obviously, he was the first man in the match, but because they instantly wanted Bad Bunny in, it should have been a couple of tags in and out so that Damien Priest had done something to the Miz and Morrison just to justify why Bad Bunny can actually have a slightly weakened opponent to start doing any moves at all against the Miz or Morrison that was what I would have done that way also because everyone's waiting for Damien Priest to get tagged in but then he isn't the novelty in the match Bad Bunny was the novelty in the match so in a sense not that it should have been that Bad Bunny gets the hot tag in but it shouldn't you know you're tagging in the person that isn't the big deal not to discredit Damien Priest in any way, it's just the hype was around this Bad Bunny person being like the novelty in the match because he's not a wrestler. He obviously, he hit a Falcon Arrow, they hit uh, dual Falcon Arrows, Priest and Bunny did on Miz and Morrison. He hit Canadian Destroyer on the outside, and literally when I saw it, I was like, whoa, because, you know, it was impressive. <coughs> they do kind of put over the idea with the Rock and Roll Express. Um, Obviously, Ricky Morton doing the Canadian Destroyer and Bad Bunny doing the Canadian Destroyer and everyone on NXT and and on AEW doing the Canadian Destroyer that anyone can do it, but I guess it is what it is. And obviously, Doomsday Device crossbody to finish the match, get the win. People have really praised Bad Bunny and he deserves the praise, but again... Whilst this is a big novelty for WrestleMania, did it get? It definitely got publicity, but did it get people watching this? And what's the harm or lack of harm? <coughs> excuse me, that it does to Miz Morrison. Miz goes from being world champion one week to losing to Bad Bunny at WrestleMania another week. Which obviously, that anyway, brings us to our main event: Sasha Banks, the women's champion for SmackDown against Bianca Belair. And this had a huge match feel. From the entrances, Sasha Banks coming out with newly coloured hair, so it's like green and blue, obviously after being blue for a long time since it used to be pink. 
and Bianca Belair uh, coming out. They both stood opposite in the ring, and you could just feel the emotion that they were breaking new ground. Uh, like this is making history here. And if you don't know the backstory on it, it was only announced that they were going to be the main event for night one within the last week. Now, why this wasn't hyped up more beforehand just shows that this was probably a last-minute decision. Maybe they saw that there were some opportunities to make history here, and that would get them some headlines. Obviously, two years ago, we had the triple threat match for the both the women's championships with Ronda Rousey, Becky Lynch, and Charlotte Flair. And... That was the first time that a women's match had main evented WrestleMania. So this is the second time that a women's match has main evented WrestleMania. Obviously only main eventing night one of two of the double of like the weekend of WrestleMania that they've only done this year and last year. But it was the first time a singles match, not a triple threat. So this is the first singles match. But also they're both African Americans. So not only is it the first time that two African-American women have main-evented WrestleMania, it's the first time that there's been a uh, match where all of the competitors in it were African-American. So breaking new ground there. And obviously the fact that they're women as well it hasn't happened in the men's division as of yet. Um, so lots of stuff here. And Bianca Belair, she literally... She almost broke down a little bit. She could see that she was smiling. There were tears. She like raised up her hands as if to say thank you to the audience. Sasha Banks was also kind of like looking like, yeah, this is unbelievable. And Sasha was the one to sort of say, look, come on, let's do this now. Bring it. And Bianca's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to bring it as well. And then they got into it. And it was a hell of a match. They really gave it absolutely they, everything they'd got. Some moments where Bianca was absolutely dominating over Sasha because she's got the power advantage, the size advantage. Uh, the the moment where she just picked up Sasha and like carried her um, full gorilla press above her head, above her head, up the steps on the outside of the ring to throw her on the inside was really impressive. I was really worried it was going to go wrong at a certain point there. But just absolutely outstanding. And of course, the hair whip. Like, Bianca's hair has come into matches continually throughout her career, just as long as she's got this incredibly long ponytail. And sometimes it's used against her, sometimes she can use it against opponents. But she did the absolute most devastating hair whip. Like, it was it was like a crack of a whip across Sasha Banks. This smack sound it was made was like louder than any Ric Flair chop, any Walter chop, this hair whip, and then probably more devastating just for the fact that when you saw Sasha after the match, she'd just got this long welt across her abdomen um from where she'd been whipped with it. So for anything else, she's got that to show for uh WrestleMania. Bianca winning, and uh, it was again, it adds to making the history when you get a match like this and a title changes hands because it just adds something else where it goes down in the history books. And so Bianca celebrated afterwards. There was some footage of Sasha on the outside looking really happy for Bianca. And obviously, that's kind of, it's a it's bad, and I'm sure there'll be some that say, Oh, Sasha should have held it together. She obviously didn't take into effect after a year of there no, not being any fans at all that a fan was filming her and we could see that she was happy for her friend um, but Bianca celebrated as the night one of Wrestlemania went off the air wow and I'm going to try and go through this next amount of matches a little bit quicker than I've done this first one because there's so much to go through but it brings us to Wrestlemania night two once again Hogan and Titus came out like I mentioned they were dressed as pirates uh, at various points, uh, we had Bailey come out and interrupt them, and eventually she was beaten up by the Bella Twins. They got in a cheeky mention of John Cena there, but not really any other uh, context to it. And it, it's the first WrestleMania in quite a long time with no John Cena at all. And when I say quite a long time, this may be the first one since about 2004, 2005, which was going to be his first WrestleMania, that he hasn't been there. It should be interesting to check that. We started 
with Randy Orton against The Fiend. And it sucked. It was a very short match. Like, in fact, just looking at this, because I've got the timings here, 5 minutes 50 seconds. So they've been building this story for a long time. Alexa Bliss uh, coming out. And do you know what? It sounded like a music box. Like, my Kindle just made a noise in the background. And I was going to say, she wound a music box. And then I heard a ding. Yep, so all my devices are making noise now. But anyway... So Alexa wound up this music box, this box-like structure as it was referred to uh, by Michael Cole, which people mocked a lot. And you could say a box-like structure, you could say a house is a box-like structure in, in many ways. But uh, five minutes, Alexa Bliss, the lights went out. Oh, Jesus, this hearing me mentioning this stupid Sorry, thing. I didn't find a device named lights. Shut up. Right, guys. Sorry, there, audience. You can hear my uh, my device because um, I referred to perhaps what it's called. It keeps speaking to me. Oh my god! It's like the fiend is about to appear and steal my soul or something. But anyway, uh, Alexa appeared after the lights went out, and she'd got a headband on, and this headband um, clearly had got some goo in it, like the oil that then just poured down her face. And she'd got the black. Uh, makeup around her eyes it kind of made her look in my opinion either a little bit like Rostak if that's the character's name that I'm thinking of in oh gosh uh, the Zack Snyder movie whatever it's called Watchmen or in the what's it called Suicide Squad like the en Enchantress just with this black goo appearing down her face clearly it was from the headband it looked cool but it didn't go anywhere this distracted the fiend who didn't look burned anymore he now had a brand new fiend mask on and I think it looks slightly redesigned I might be wrong and I think it's just because they realised that this burnt up fiend look just looks dumb uh, but they, they, they had him on TV with it before so now they can sell the figures of it but the burnt up fiend look didn't look good. <coughs> so he's regenerated to some degree. The fiend, Bray Wyatt, did a nice little tribute uh, doing a pose and catchphrase of Brody Lee at WrestleMania. But the fiend was distracted by Alexa Bliss and then Randy Orton won in 5 minutes and 50 seconds. And the audience were like, what the hell is this? And I completely agree, it sucked. It was not a good start. After WrestleMania... 37 night one just going back very quickly we're opening with Lashley and, and Drew that was like a 20 minute match it was hard hitting it was a good match the tag team turmoil match Cesaro you know AJ Styles New Day um, steel cage match with Braun and Shane Bad Bunny tag match Miz Morrison Damian Priest Bianca Bella Sasha Banks they were it was basically hit after hit after hit. There was honestly not really a bad match amongst that batch. So it was a bit of a shame that night two would start off Randy Orton and The Fiend in just more silly shenanigans, nonsense, short match. And after Randy Orton and Edge had that very, very long match last year and then the greatest wrestling match of all time in the middle of last year with Orton being on such a good run, even leading into WrestleMania last year, that this is then what he gets this year. Wasn't wasn't what it should have been. Uh, Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler defeated Natty and Tamina, and that was a real shame just because, again, like I mentioned, Tamina really is in the position where she was suddenly, you know, hotter than she's been with the crowd ever, suddenly pushed to a tag team championship match at WrestleMania and then loses here. This should have been her WrestleMania moment. That's all I'm going to say. But anyway, moving on. Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn. Good match, as always, from these guys. Logan Paul being there. Meh. Like, they've got another celebrity involved. But really, like, it didn't mean anything. This whole storyline with Sami Zayn and this conspiracy... Sami Zayn is very entertaining as a character, good on the mic. Owens is good on the mic. Feels like the fact that these guys have had years now of we're getting to a feud with each other again, for it to be going to WrestleMania and then them just saying, oh, it's conspiracies, and here's Logan Paul. And I honestly didn't know who Logan Paul was like before this. He's like, he's a big YouTuber. Woo! Yeah. 
Okay? So the fact that it's like, oh no, it's like Judy Bagwell on a pole match. It's like, who's Logan Paul the guest of? Sami Zayn's like, no, you're my guest. And, but anyway... Kevin Owens won after the match. Logan Paul got in, and Sami Zayn, like you know, he was speaking to Sami Zayn, but then Kevin Owens spoke to him, and Sami was like, "No, like you're my friend." And then we ended up just with a Steve Austin moment where Kevin Owens ended up doing a stunner on Logan Paul, and he sold it okay enough, but like really, he didn't sell it like any wrestler does. He just kind of dropped like a ton of bricks. But I guess it is what it is. You know, good for him. They got that moment. Sheamus and Riddle, decent match. Again, none of these are particularly long matches compared to the night before. So the night before, we had like 18 minutes, 14 minutes, 11. The shortest match was AJ, which again is a crying shame. And Kofi, just absolute crying shame. Such good wrestlers in a short match. Um, Braun and Shane wasn't that long a match. Bad Bunny and and, and Damian Priest against Miz and Morrison was three times as long as the Randy Orton match this night. But anyway, Sheamus beat Riddle in 10 minutes, and that was a little bit surprising. I didn't expect Sheamus to do it. Sheamus is someone who always gets used and then forgotten, and you kind of forget that he's a multi-time world champion. They've never really pushed him to be as big a star as he had the potential to be, and obviously he's had some injuries over the last two, three years, and that, you know, that he's been able to come back is great, and so giving him the US Championship is fine. His program a few months ago with Drew McIntyre for the world title, fine again, but you know he's someone that they'll bring up, say, oh yeah, he's a former world champion, will challenge for the title against Drew, and there's this storyline because they've known each other a long time, but then instantly he's, now he's just in the US title picture, and he's the US champion, so it's like, why isn't he going again for the world title? They just drop Sheamus constantly like that. Apollo Crews defeating Big E in a Nigerian drum fight. Um, yeah, it, it was a good match. Not not that long. You know, they had their excuse to have their props involved, and then we had, oh gosh, I forget his name, that ran in, that used to be on like Raw Underground. What the heck was his name? Let's, let's see if we get his name. US Championship. Uh, Dabakato, of course. Dabakato emerged from the crowd. Now this guy, clearly green as anything that he came in, was doing the whole Raw Underground shoot fight, street fight silliness. Apparently he's been with WWE since 2016. Wow, that's uh, that's crazy. He was drafted to Raw, and then and then like in October, and he hasn't been seen since then. So to bring him out just as the heavy for Apollo Cruz at at WrestleMania, obviously that gives him a bit more juice. That juices him up to perhaps be used in some way, but obviously just still not as a singles talent just in the corner but I'm sure he'll get a match with Big E at some point then we had Oscar and Rhea Ripley and yeah again very good match these you know they're very good both of these being in the penultimate match of night two of Wrestlemania is great but it isn't quite the position that Bianca and Sasha are in on night one obviously you know the fact they had a women's world title match as the main event of night one is still only the second time that's happened uh it feels a shame for oscar just because she more than anyone over the course of the pandemic just brought out so much more personality so much character was someone who vocally made their the matches interesting just without there being an audience there always very consistently really good in the ring and won a Royal Rumble, the first women's Royal Rumble a few years ago. Then when it was the Becky Two Belt situation with the world title main event a couple of years ago, she was the world champion, the women's world champion until a week before when I think Charlotte took it and they said all the belts were on the line rather than just adding Oscar in there. So she was kind of screwed over out of having a WrestleMania main event. The penultimate match on night two isn't bad, 
but she lost here. She lost when she won the Royal Rumble a couple of years ago. I'm not sure she, if she has ever won at WrestleMania. Rhea Ripley, obviously, she gets a little bit of redemption after last year. She had the match with Charlotte Flair for the NXT Women's Championship, and she lost, which, again, surprised everyone. Was that last year? I think it was. Maybe it was two years ago. Let's just have a look. Um, yeah, I think so. So let's just go back here. Check Fact-checking once again. Mm, I can't find it. I, I think I'm right in that. But yeah, WrestleMania 36. And so then Flair won the Royal Rumble and decided to challenge for the NXT title. And obviously, uh, that's just... It worked at the time in terms of story, but for historical purposes, going for that title at WrestleMania. She won it. Rhea Ripley uh, lost. But then she got her win back this year. And again, 13-minute match. Uh, good back and forth stuff. And clean finish at the end there. And that brings us to the final match. The second main event for WrestleMania. And the main event for Night 2. And that was Roman Reigns defeating Edge and Daniel Bryan. So, this was really good. The fact that Daniel Bryan gets a second WrestleMania main event is great for Daniel Bryan. Obviously, WrestleMania 30, he was added to a triple threat match um, that was originally just meant to be Batista and Randy Orton. And he ended up winning. And that was absolutely his night. The audience, first time with the audience there in however long it's been... They were going yes, 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 and maybe part of this came out the fact that maybe part of it was that, well, Edge just won a Royal Rumble after being in at number one, so clearly they, they're they not that worried that Edge couldn't go, but maybe there was some injury that we're not aware of, or some like worry that they just felt like, well, let's make it a three-way just to take the pressure off of Edge or Roman, but you assume it's probably Edge if someone's got the bigger injury concern there. So they added in Daniel Bryan. Also adding in Daniel Bryan will make it a better match. And also, and I think this is one of the key things, in front of a crowd for the first time in a year, just getting them all going, yes, 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 doing the hand movements, uh, shouting out loud. There were obviously only 25,000 people there in what is normally a 60, 70,000 seat arena. Uh, or a stadium, I should say. And so maybe the sound was just lost a little bit. It may have been incredibly loud there. But they didn't seem quite as loud, and they didn't quite seem as absolutely set on chanting for um, Daniel Bryan as in the past. But still, I'm sure that was a big factor into it. Um, and it was a great match again. It was a very good triple threat main event. We've had a few. I wouldn't say this beat... Daniel Bryan's last one, just the crowd was so into that, and the atmosphere was so electric. Although this technically may have been a better match, um, but I haven't watched that last one in a little while, just to be able to form an opinion on it just yet. Uh, Edge, towards the end, brought in the chair, and my god, we got this unbelievable moment where a piece of a broken chair was just put into roman reigns mouth and edge was just tugging on it for like a cross face uh reigns was about to tap daniel bryan stopped the tap and put him into the yes lock and it's just like what could the referee do there like this was a situation where just in terms of what literally could happen they could say that because he can't tap out both of his hands are tied up he can't quit he can't submit vocally because his mouth has got a piece of a broken steel chair in it the referee should have just stopped the match. Said Roman Reigns is eliminated, even though it's first fall to a finish. Which actually brings us to the ending. Even though this was a, this was kind of stereotypical WrestleMania main event, where you know lots of fast action, it just being a triple threat at the beginning, but then some brawling on the outside, some near falls, false finishes, and all this. But for the ending, for the ending to be that Roman got Daniel Bryan and he put Edge on top of him, I was like, what the hell is he doing? He's helping Edge win. And then he pinned them both. I looked at this situation, I felt like, now, what is the, what is the decision here? Because 
he put Edge on top of Daniel Bryan. Now, technically, Edge is pinning Daniel Bryan as well. And if it's the first fall to a finish, then technically, doesn't Edge win? But when I looked at it again, the way he put Edge on top of Daniel Bryan, and whether this is just happy accident or intended, actually meant that Daniel Bryan could be seen as rolling up Edge. And so if he was rolling up Edge, then the way Edge was across him was that his back end was up on top of Daniel Bryan, his shoulder, Edge's shoulders were on the mat, and you could say Daniel Bryan was beating Edge. And now, if you've got that situation, you could say that they've both been pinned, they've pinned each other, they've both won, they've both lost. So because of that, Roman Reigns pinning both of them, which he absolutely was does mean I believe that he should be the one named the champion and the winner at the end there. But it was just an interesting thing because all of them technically got a pin, although the only one who wasn't pinned was Roman. Was it a surprise for Roman to win? The the idea of Edge coming back a year ago, he obviously didn't get his moment in front of the crowd because of the pandemic last year. He got his moment in front of the crowd this year, but by the time they actually got him in front of the crowd, they'd panicked for whatever reason and suddenly had the thought that oh is edge uh not the guy to have and so edge was suddenly quite heelish not absolutely heel but fairly heel daniel bryan did have claims for why he should be in this match but not really enough to be honest but he was the face i guess and roman has been like uh their best heel for quite some time uh, over the last few months And Roman, again, because he didn't get his WrestleMania moment last year, he had to step away from WrestleMania to fight Goldberg, and we ended up with Strowman in Roman's place. Him, when he came back, they made him heal, they went all in on him heal, he's got Paul Heyman in his corner, he had Jey Uso cheating, super kicks and all this sort of stuff, getting involved towards the end just to help Roman win. Again, a little bit similar to Bobby Lashley, with Bobby Lashley being a heel and then winning, and Roman Reigns being a heel and then winning. Um, in both the men's world titles, the heels retained. And does it just is this the opportunity just to re-establish? Yes, you know these are our main eventers. We'll do this in front of an audience, and we don't give the audience the happy ever after now, just because I believe tonight is back in the Thunderdome. And if they're still in front of the Thunderdome, even though they're in front of the fans here, having the happily ever after here just to then be in front of virtual fans doesn't necessarily work. So, will it be SummerSlam? Where, like, okay, we're fully back in front of live crowds. I don't know. Maybe it's already been announced and I just need to research this. But will it be that at the... SummerSlam, where it's like, we'll build up Roman Reigns, Bobby Lashley, they're two mega heels, who can defeat them? Oh, and now it will be Daniel Bryan, or now it will be Edge, now that he's seen the light and is a face again. And perhaps it will be Drew McIntyre building up to SummerSlam in front of 70,000 fans in front of a live crowd, you know, in August. And that will be the launch of... Okay, the, we're going to have the happily ever after because now we're permanently back with live audiences and we've passed the pandemic. Everyone's been vaccinated. Woohoo! Is that the situation? Who knows? Now, overall, let's just give a overall rating. Out of five, I am going to give WrestleMania Night 1 a 4.5 out of 5. There's a couple of things that could have been better. I'd like to have seen... Uh, Kofi Kingston and AJ Styles in a singles match rather than the tag match, perhaps. Omos was good, but, you know, again, just AJ, Kofi Mania a couple of years ago, it feels like both of them could have been used better. Braun and Shane, it was what it was, but it was kind of exactly as I expected it to be. Bad Bunny was a highlight. He over-delivered compared to what you expected. Uh, Bianca Belair, Sasha Banks absolutely worked their butts off. Had a stonking main event match. Uh, Cesaro, you know, so everyone seems so pleased to be back in front of a live crowd. Uh, especially on night one. Uh, Lashley and McIntyre was a hell of... I enjoyed that match so much. And maybe, again, it was just their enthusiasm being in front of a crowd. Um... 
and just the atmosphere of them being in front of a crowd maybe it was just so exciting to see that after such a long time you know but i think that was you know a fantastic match night two obviously wasn't quite as good randy orton and the fiend was a complete dud in my opinion uh naya and Shayna, fair enough they win it felt like it should have been natty and tamina that won there but um still good match kevin owens Sami Zayn, solid as you'd always expect from them nothing wrong with it but it wasn't perhaps their best match ever Sheamus and Riddle was as good match as I feel like we would have expected from them. So again, it was night two, my overall feeling, just as I'm going through it. Apollo Crews, you know, good for him to have this WrestleMania moment. He's been there for quite a few years as well to finally be getting a push. I'm not sure about this character change he's got. I feel like he would have been better as a face, but uh, we'll see how this develops because this isn't, you know, they've only been going on it a little while. Um shame lots of people would have liked to have seen big e get the push to uh, main event mania this year and maybe that will happen next year again i'm not sure if like people's ages is starting to catch up on them here rhea ripley oscar good obviously not as good as the women's championship match that main evented the night before roman reigns edge daniel bryan very very good uh, again, I'm not sure if I enjoyed it more than I did McIntyre and Lashley, but you know, very solid main event there, and I think probably the best match on night two. Overall, I think night one was better than night two, um, but overall, for this being the first one back in front of a live audience, despite any of the um, rain and severe weather warnings and all of this, I think they put on a fantastic show. And there was some elements where perhaps they made certain decisions based on where we're not going to be permanently back in front of a live crowd just yet. Maybe there was some things that they did just because they're in front of a live crowd to be a bit more crowd pleasing to make this memorable as they could. Played it safe in certain ways. Took some chances, gave us some unexpected results. But again, my theory on that is that they're just going to save things perhaps for SummerSlam or for whenever they think things are safe enough with the pandemic. But yeah, really, really great uh, WrestleMania. I thoroughly enjoyed it. The most I have enjoyed a pro wrestling show in in a year, truthfully. Absolutely in a year. There's been some good shows. I enjoyed the AEW show last year with the Stadium Stampede for its craziness, for the fact that they pulled off as good a show as they did in that situation. I really enjoyed the NWA show, the pay-per-view from a few weeks ago. Just for the fact that, again, I enjoy that because it was back. And, yeah, there's been some good WWE shows. There's been some good Dynamite, some good... Well, there's not been too many good Raws, to be honest. But there's been some good pay-per-views. There's also been some bad pay-per-views. Hopefully, this is going to be the start of things going back to what, the way they were. Moving away from some of these cinematic matches. Obviously, the stuff with The Fiend was still a little bit dodgy. Um, but they had to put on the red lights, didn't mention that earlier, just because obviously they couldn't do any edited matches anymore. So when they probably realised that they can't actually edit these matches anymore, they just realised that they would only give it five minutes. So, with this, this wraps up my thoughts for WrestleMania 37. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Let me know what your thoughts are. You can find the Twitter for the Slam Jam Wrestling Show at Slam Jam Show on Twitter. You can find me at David Postansky. Obviously, the website where you'll find these podcasts is extremes.tv, which is X-S-T-R-E-A-M-E-D dot TV. And that's part of the Extreme Improv Extremed network. So please do take a moment to head over to youtube.com forward slash Extreme Improv and smash that subscribe button. Every single week we have the Slam Jam Wrestling Show in addition to this podcast. I'm going to make this podcast much more regular going forward, so do listen out for it. Um, the Slam Jam Wrestling Show, if you haven't seen it before, is a kind of comedy panel show where myself as the host, plus a bunch of other wrestling maniacs, wrestling fans, all come together and take part in silly wrestling challenges. So we'll do some promo battles, we'll do some trivia-based games, we'll do some that are based around wrestling music and theme tunes. We always like a good music round. We will have um, some 
promo battles and some we'll like do 20 questions and all kinds of just fun wrestling themed challenges so imagine if it was like a, a quiz show plus silly challenges plus a little bit of improv all mixed together for the ultimate show for a wrestling fan to enjoy so do check out the slam jam wrestling show on youtube.com forward slash extreme improv so i think that will just about wrap it up so once again i hope you've enjoyed the show do check out everything from extremed on extreme.tv there's constantly articles and things on there about wrestling and from me until next time stay safe always stay extremed and ciao for now <laughs>